nothing compares to the promises that we have in the Father. See amazing grace with us.
but the whole, all of it, was nailed to the cross and then buried there. Oh God, we thank you so much for what you've given to us. Your love for us, you lavished your love on us, as John wrote. You lavished it upon us. You poured it out upon us. We cannot even comprehend how great your love is today. So, Father, as we gather here today, we come as a needy people. We have needs, Lord, and we pray that you touch those needs and minister to those who have a special need today. We pray for our nation. We pray, Lord, for those in authority over us. We pray for our armed forces, where they are, Lord, that you would protect them. We pray, Lord, for fellow Christians around the world. We pray for the national church, the pastors of those churches. We pray for our missionaries who have gone to other cultures to, to take the gospel and to train nationals to serve. Lord, we thank you for that. We also pray today for our beloved persecuted brothers and sisters. As we heard last week, let us never forget what they are going through today for being faithful, sometimes even more than we, to the truth we've just shared and knowing that Jesus died on the cross for them. They will not renounce his name and they suffer for it. We pray today that as maybe groups of them are trying to worship, or they are worshiping, they're trying to do it in secret because they will be found out. Father, I pray that you would bless their worship as you would bless our worship today to bring glory and honor to you. It's not for us. It's not, it's not a show. It's not a concert. It's not, it's not something that we're here to, to see how good we perform. But we are here today, Lord, to offer up a worship to you that you might be pleased, that you might receive our worship, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, and all of those who agree with me this morning say, Amen. 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 You may be seated. Just a couple of announcements I want to mention to you. Um, uh, two weeks from today, we want to make sure that you bring your Christmas child boxes. And when we bring them every year, you remember if you were here before, we put them on the steps up here, and then we pray over them before we send them to the uh, collection centers, and if you don't bring them on two, on Sunday, there's no other chance because they'll be taken uh, right away to the collection center uh, to be sent on to uh, other regional centers and so forth. And then, as we saw in the videos that we've shown, where they put them on the boxes on the back of a camel <laughs> and they take them to these inner, inner communities, uh, inner villages, and you have a part in that. You you've uh, done something as you prepared your box to bless a child around the world. So please be able to do that two weeks from today. Uh, also, um, we had sent out a church newsletter for a long time uh, because of the COVID, but we did send one out. And if you did not get one, uh, I don't know who all did not get one. I tried my best with the, uh, with the mailing list. But if you did not get one, there are extras at the back uh, information center. Please take one that you, when you take it, Make sure that you give Jamie your name and address so we are sure we have it. Because if I don't have it, you won't get the next one. And so we want to make sure that's the case. Okay? So, so please check out the newsletter uh, if you would next week. We're going to honor our veterans today. Uh, veterans Day is Wednesday, 11 11. And we are uh, wanting to honor our veterans today. Um, I'm going to say some things afterwards, but we're going to play a video of the Armed Forces Medley. And you've seen this before, you've, you're familiar with it, but what we're going to ask all of our veterans to do is when your um, branch song is played, we're going to ask that you would stand. Uh, stand proudly uh, for your service in that particular branch. And at the conclusion of that, we're going to say a few more words. But uh, as we show the video, uh, again, if you, whichever branch you served under, please stand while your song is played.
It's more than tangible things. It's more than what we give them in terms of material goods. We also need to respect them. Every veteran deserves our unfettered respect. There is never an excuse to disrespect a veteran. And most importantly, we need to thank them. Not on Veterans Day only, not on Memorial Day only, not on the 4th of July only. Whenever you see a veteran, you need to thank them for their service. Because I'm going to tell you something. If it were not for them, it's likely that we would not be here today with the freedom that we have to come to this place and churches around this nation and freely worship our Lord and our God. Amen. Amen. It's because of the veteran. And so I'm going to ask once again, would you as a congregation join me in thanking all of our veterans of veterans today.
continuing along with what we just shared, I'd like to focus on the subject this morning that we are free to worship. We are free to worship. And our scripture texts this morning are short. There's one coming from Exodus chapter 8, the first verse, and then Romans chapter 13, verses 7 to 10. In Exodus we read, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord says, Let my people go, so that they may worship me. And in Romans 13, the Apostle Paul writes these words, Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another, for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be, are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, Love is the fulfillment of the law. Let's pray. Father, your word gives us much to think about. It gives us direction for life. And Paul, in his letter to the Romans, gave us some things that are directive of how we should participate and live in a society with other people. The application of these verses is broad. We thank you for our veterans. We thank you that we have those with us this morning that we can honor, that we can show our respect to. But we thank you for the thousands and thousands of veterans who served to help preserve our freedom. And so, Father, today as we talk about this concept that we are free to worship, that you would remind us, remind us of why we are. And we pray in Jesus' name these things. Amen. Charles Province wrote this article, whatever you want to call it. You've heard it before, I'm sure, but I'm going to share it with you this morning. It says, it is the soldier, not the minister, who has given us the freedom of religion. It is the soldier, not the reporter, who has given us freedom of the press. It is the soldier, not the poet, who has given us freedom of speech. It is the soldier, not the campus organizer, who has given us freedom to protest. It is the soldier, not the lawyer, who has given us the right to a fair trial. It is the soldier, not the politician, who has given us the right to vote. It is the soldier who salutes the flag, who serves beneath the flag, and whose coffin is draped by the flag, who allows the protester to burn the flag. Let us never forget. Never forget. Last Sunday we focused on over 260 million Christians around the world who are living in persecution and who are not free 
to worship as we are worshiping today. Now I know sometimes we wake up on Sunday morning, don't we? And you have this little battle in your mind. Uh, do I really want to go to church today? And I'm not going to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to identify yourself, but I'm going to guarantee you that every single person in this room, and I'm not excluding myself, has had those thoughts on Sunday morning. I've had that argument with my wife, and she reminds me, you've got to go, you're the pastor. <laughs> that was good. But we take for granted what we have available to us, and we come to church, and sometimes we're, our minds are just overwhelmed by other things. Sometimes get overwhelmed by other people and maybe something that's happened between us and them. And, and those, those kind of things that, you know, we just don't want to worship. And yet we are free to worship today. We are free to come here today and let it all loose. Without inhibition, we can stand or sit and sing the songs we've sung. And we can offer up the praise to God. And no one's going to stop you from doing that. Today, we've already focused and continue to focus on those who have served our country through the armed forces. To ensure that we continue to have those freedoms here in the United States. Are we so naive to think that it will always be here? I've lived long enough now, and many of you, or some of you, I guess, here this morning have lived longer. You and I both basically assume this will be this way all the time. We've lived it. It's been a part of us all of our lives. But I'm not so sure that if we live long enough, we may see the day come when some of these freedoms will not be as sure as they are today. Respect has eroded to an alarming level in our country. Our freedom, one's freedom of expression has been accepted as permission, permission to offend, to degrade and ignore the history of our country and the honor that others deserve. Injustice exists. I do not deny that there is injustice in our country today, and even there are those groups who suffer it more perhaps than others. Injustice is a blight on any people, and is something that the Christian church cannot ignore. But disrespecting those who have sacrificed to provide the freedoms we have, even to protest, even in protest, is not acceptable either. God's mandate to Pharaoh to let his people go was tied to worship. Let my people go so that they may worship me. Restrictions that were placed on churches during this pandemic and still exist in some states of our union are tied to worship. The persecution of Christians around the world is tied to worship. The freedom to gather to worship has always been an especially important part of the life of God's people. There is something within that human being 
that craves to worship. Now, before you misinterpret what I just said, I did not say there's something that's in a human being that craves to worship Jesus Christ or to worship God. Because not all people do that. But there is something innate in the human being that craves to worship something or someone. And so we have many objects of worship today in the world and in our society. But the freedom to gather together, whether it be a Christian church, another religion, or even a non-religion, the freedom to gather to pursue the worship that the, whatever it is that people will worship is something, an important life, an important part of the life. And for us as Christians, which we're going to focus on for the balance, is the fact that it's important to us to worship as God's people. So let's look at a couple things this morning. First of all, we are indebted to others for what we've been given. This deserves to be said. This needs to be said today. We are indebted to others for what we've been given. Scripture tells us that we should not be in debt to others. And everyone who carries Consumer debt today knows what I'm talking about. It makes us servants to the lender. And it also inhibits our ability to glorify God with our finances. How many people have lamented? I would love to give more to God's ministries. I would love to support more missionaries. I'd love to support the church more. I would love to do this or do that. But I cannot. My budget will not allow when they, in fact, are paying sometimes hundreds of dollars a month in interest. Don't, be, don't do this if you don't want to be depressed. But just go back and look at how much interest you paid or are paying on those credit cards and on those loans that you have that's going down the drain every single month and every single year. And so the Bible says, don't be in debt. And that's easier said than done. Isn't it? I know. But it's something that we ought to work at. Also, when we pay our bills, it adds to our integrity. When churches pay their bills, well, I'll tell you what, I am so thankful for the financial integrity of the Church of Genesis. In over 29 years that I've been in this office, and I have seen that our bills are paid on time. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't insured that. The treasury does that. But I have notes that, that way that our, uh, that our bills are paid on time all the time. That is something. Because there are churches out there that don't do that. It used to be back when my, my parents were my age or younger and when I was a child that if the church wanted something, their, their, their credit was good as anything. They, you, you're a church, you need, you, need, you, need, you need to charge this uh, these plumbing materials to, to, to work on your, your restrooms. No problem. You know, you'll pay. Not so anymore. We are not to be in debt. And so Paul addresses this. He says, we are to give everyone what we owe them. We are to pay our obligations. If we have an obligation, we need to pay it. Who enjoys paying taxes? Anybody? I'll tell you, it's, it's, not, it's not something we enjoy doing. Well, you see, for most, many people, most people, every time they get a paycheck, there's no stuff there. Shows what you really earn, and then they start willing away at what went for this tax and that tax and that tax, and then you look down at the bottom and it says net pay. Whew. Wow, there's a difference here, isn't there? And so 
you, if you notice it, you think about it, but most of us don't think about it because it's, it's not on the table. When you think about how much you make, you don't think about the gross pay. You think about what the check is written for, what your take-home pay is, and that's how much you live on. That's the way it works. Now, pastors and ministers are considered self-employed for this purpose, and so my income taxes are not taken out of my paycheck. And so every quarter, I'm obligated to send in one-fourth of my expected taxes. You think it's depressing to see the difference between your gross pay and net pay on your weekly sub, you got to write that big check. The biggest check I write every quarter is for my taxes to the IRS, the United States Treasury, and I fill it out. No one enjoys paying taxes, but it's an obligation. It's something that we are supposed to do. Taxes are necessary to fund the common good. How do we pay for services that are provided for us? How do we pay for those firemen? And how do we pay for those police officers? How do we pay for members of Congress? Oh, we'll go there. But how, how do we pay all these things that are provided for us today? We may disagree with the policies, but we are to pay taxes. Paul says, if you owe taxes, pay taxes. If you owe revenue, pay revenue. What's revenue? Well, revenue is similar, but it's more geared to consumerism. And so you go out and you buy something and you have a little tax on it. You often say, this is from the government. The state sales tax. And you think what you buy is a small thing, you don't even think about it. You know? You go to Burger King, you get a sausage biscuit, it's a dollar. Six cents for the governor? Okay, it's a dollar six. But go out and buy a new car that's $30,000 vehicle or more or less. And you say, well, that's about that. No, I, can, I can handle that. And then you tap on this percentage for sales tax. <clears throat> Boy, does that hurt. Paul says, you owe taxes, you pay taxes, you owe revenue, you pay revenue. But we are also to respect and honor, and that's what we're talking about this morning, those who hold positions deserving of such respect. Now, this is true even if you disagree with them. Our country is in a very bad state of affairs right now. Because we have lost that respect. I'm not saying this to point fingers at any group of people or any political party. It appears as though we have a new president elect. And I believe that he deserves the respect of our people because of the position he holds. We may not agree with policies. We may not do, we agree with the actions that are taken, but respect is something we owe to other people. You may disagree with me on that. But I'm gonna tell you, every Sunday, I try to pray for those in authority over us. And that doesn't change if the Democrat is in the White House or a Republican is in the White House. We pray for those that authority over us. Every soldier, every veteran deserves our respect and honor because they have sacrificially served some in very unpopular wars on our behalf. It is, again, unconscionable that our Vietnam veterans returned from serving in Southeast Asia
with the disrespect that is shown to them by people in this country. It is a travesty. It should never have happened if it did. It should never happen again. I hope it doesn't. But as we share this morning, we need to do our best to make up for it. Our continuing debt is to love one another. Now, even though Paul says we should not be in debt, this is one debt that is never paid off. And something that Paul says here right, jumped out at me in my preparation for the day. He wrote this. He mentioned several of the commands taken from the Ten Commandments. And then he says, and whatever command there may be, in other words, he groups them all together. Whatever command, just whatever command there is, all of them, all of them, all of them, not some, not a few, not the ones we like, all of the commands are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor. As yourself. And then he says something quite interesting. In verse 10, he says, Love does no harm to a neighbor. Hmm. Do you like your neighbors? Do you have good neighbors or do you have cantankerous neighbors? Do you have neighbors that throw the trash over the line? Do you have neighbors who, who do things that irritate you? Ever want to get back at them? This is an age-old thing. It's something that we've done over the century. You know, neighbors back and forth. In fact, you write, you find in Proverbs that says, do not move a boundary stone. Do not do that. Respect your neighbor. And this is why love is the fulfillment of the law. It's because love does no harm to a neighbor. We ought to live by the principle that we would not intentionally do anything or say anything that would hurt our neighbor. Let me say that again. Let that sink in, please. We ought to live by the principle that we would not intentionally do anything or say anything that would hurt our neighbor. Imagine what difference that would make in our society. Imagine what difference that would make in the political discourse that has eroded so much if we would just say nothing that intentionally hurt someone else. Some of you might have seen the, the meme that I posted on our church uh, Facebook page this week. I love that. I, it's the only time, I think, in this whole process that I posted anything political. But I couldn't resist it. There's that little frog, and the lizard beside the frog, the lizard has his hand clapped over the frog's mouth. And the meme calls the lizard the Holy Spirit and the frog me, when I'm tempted to say, post something on someone's political comments or comment on someone's political post. You know, sometimes it's just better if the Holy Spirit just clamps his mouth, hand over her mouth, you know? And says, don't say it. Don't say it. Just imagine what would be different if we would not have the vitriol that we've seen over the past couple of years. The second thing we see in this passage is that we are indebted to others for our, passage, our freedom. We're indebted to others for our freedom. You know, we, we want to be free, don't we? We long to be free. I, probably every one of us as a child 
at one time said it, or if he didn't say it, he thought it. I can't wait to get out of this house and be my own boss. Boy, was that something we should have wished for. That sort of changed the landscape, didn't it? But when you're growing up, all those rules of this house are too overbearing. I can't, I can't live like this. Those who have been incarcerated and lost their freedom know the, 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 the value of freedom. And we, we all, people, we highly value our freedom. We don't want anybody to tell us what we can or cannot do. But freedom is not free. It doesn't just happen. That's why so many countries today in the world do not have the freedoms we have today because they've lost it or never had it. Freedom costs someone something. Freedom has historically been a personal issue. It's very personal, isn't it? In ancient culture, Bible times and before, people paid their debts. Sometimes, when they didn't have the money, they sold themselves to the creditors. And when they worked long enough, they were paid up and they were free. Even in our own country, there was a debtor's prison. And these were banned on the wall back in the 1800s. And it wasn't until 1983, not that long ago, that the Supreme Court affirmed that incarcerating indigent debtors was unconstitutional. Debtor's prison. People also were enslaved out of oppression or retribution. When Joseph was sold into slavery in Egypt, and he found favor with Pharaoh, and he was able to bring his family members to Egypt during this terrible, terrible famine. There were 70 of his family that came to Egypt. Did you know when they left Egypt in the Exodus? It's estimated that there were well over a million people who left Egypt in the Exodus. They're a prime example of people being enslaved out of oppression or retribution. What happened? Pharaoh, which is a different Pharaoh than the one who uh, got like, like, uh, like Joseph, a different Pharaoh said, you know what? We're getting overrun by these Israelites. What if they rebel against us? What if they rise up and revolt against us? And that's why there were edicts that went out that if a boy baby was born, he was to be killed because they were afraid of getting all these Israelite males that would revolt. And you know the story of Moses, who actually became the one who was God's messenger to Pharaoh. You know the story of the Israelites in Egypt and how they had to meet the quotas and when Moses complained on their behalf, then Pharaoh says, okay, we'll take away the straw. Find your own straw for making the bricks and made it even harder for them. And, you know, it wasn't like they didn't meet their quota and they went home at night and they tallied it up and said, oh, well, we'll make up tomorrow. No, if they didn't meet their quota, they were beaten. They were oppressed. Terrible, terrible times. People have been enslaved because of perceived inferiority by race or nationality. The blight of human slavery in our nation's history is horrendous. I know historically, back in those days, it wasn't perceived as wrong as it should have been. There were people of fame that were 
slaveholders. But it is still horrendous. It's a blight on our historical past. Europeans and Africans especially suffered under this injustice until the 19th century. We value our personal freedom. Wars have been fought to establish or preserve achieved freedoms. I hated history in school when I was in school as a child and teenager, but as I grew older, I wish now that they were teaching more history in our schools today. Because many are growing up not knowing history. The Revolutionary War was fought to establish freedom from the rule of England. The Civil War was fought to establish freedom for slaves. The World Wars were fought to preserve freedom from world tyranny. And our veterans risked their lives and saw many of their comrades lose their lives for this cause. Folks, I want you to think about something. Those of us who did not serve in the military, those of us who are not veterans today, do not know the experiences that our veterans have had. Some of the veterans who we have today did not see combat, many others did. It's not just that we didn't put in our two or four years or whatever to serve. It's not just that we were shipped off to another country and another place in the world. It's not that we were just deprived of the freedom of being with family and so forth here at home. But our veterans held friends in their dying moments as they were bleeding out on the battlefield. Our veterans experienced war like I would never want to experience, and neither would you. General Sherman said those famous words, and as they're his words, not mine, war is hell. The veterans that stood today in our church and those at home, many of you have not only experienced it, but it's something that will never ever get out of your mind. It's something that will be with you forever. And that's further reason why we want to say thank you to you for your service. The United States Constitution exists to preserve personal freedom. We speak about the Bill of Rights. Some young people today aren't even aware of what that means. The First Amendment states, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. That is a First Amendment, the First Amendment right of every citizen of the United States of America. But there's one more that I can think of, and there may be even more. Currently, there is slavery, currently, right now, in America, there is slavery that is too often overlooked and ignored. And that is the slavery of human trafficking. And if you have been aware of the news, it has hit Newcastle these past two weeks. I'll say no more. You can Google that yourself. It's unconscionable that the church, Christian church, Christian churches are not aware of the blight of sex slaves, pedophilia, 
humans that are being trafficked and sold in the dark world of our country, as well as around the world. And so freedom is a personal issue. But as we come to a close this morning, let me say this. Freedom is also a spiritual issue. Freedom is also a spiritual issue. We talked about it this morning in some of the songs we sang and the comments afterwards. We are freed from sin's bondage. Oh. Again, I, I, I cannot, I cannot express enough. We sang Amazing Grace, a different version than what we usually, uh, you know, the, the, the most famous one. But it said, my chains fell off. My chains fell off. Free from sin. Romans 6 says, for we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. Free from uh, Again, the people we can't do that this morning, but we talked about it very quickly. We're not perfect. We still hope. What does it mean to us? A false standard. Even though we say that the fact that the But even though we sin, we no longer are needy slaves. But Jesus paid the price. He broke the chains. You are slaves of the one you obey. We are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you slaves, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that is now claimed your Jesus. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Someone, and I don't know who it was, but I read many times, said these words. Only two defining forces offered to die for you. Jesus Christ and the American soldier. One died for your soul, the other died for your freedom. We are free to worship today, first because Jesus Christ died for our sins and released us from its bondage, and secondly because people, some we know, we see them today, and some will never, ever know. Sacrificially serve to preserve this freedom. And we say thank you for both. Growing up, there's an old hymn in the church that we all often sang at the altar call. You know, almost every service there's an altar call. We sing, we sing 18 verses of a four-verse hymn. You know, we sing over and over and over and over. We don't sing much anymore. But this one got my mind this week. Out of my bondage, sorrow and night. Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come. Into thy freedom, gladness and light. Jesus, I come to thee. 
Out of my sickness, into thy wealth, health. Out of my want, and into thy wealth. Out of my sin, and into thyself. Jesus, I come to thee. Folks, that's ours. That's what Jesus did for us. For that spiritual freedom. And yes, our veterans served to preserve our personal freedom. Don't forget to say thank you to both. Father, today again we thank you for your presence. We thank you for the Holy Spirit applying the words of the scriptures to our hearts. Help us, Lord, to come to you. Thank you for the freedom that you bring. In Jesus' name we pray. Guide us and direct us in all we say to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.